I bring with me Stefan, who's a graduate of Laurent and who's got his master's in physics. And he works with us in building a lot of the systems that you see out here today. So um, I'm going to start. Oh, yeah. Um, I started in this business a very long time ago in comparison to most of the younger people in the room. Um, I think the first time that I went for a ride in a robot was at Carnegie Mellon University with a friend of mine by the name of Red Whitaker. And we sat in his Ford O'Connelline van in, before the year 2000, let's say. And uh, it drove us around the block. And uh, you could see that the future of robotics was coming at us. And since then, I have many friends that work in that field. But one of the areas that um, people don't tend to focus on is in what's called teleautonomy. And um, this robot is, a, is an, a, takes all the different aspects of teleautonomy and puts it all together. Um, now, you may ask what teleautonomy is. The idea is being able to put somebody like Stefan virtually in the seat of a robot using computer networking. And so Stefan is actually looking through the cameras on the machine to run the robot, just as if he was driving it on a car where he's got the steering wheel in his hand. One of the most important parts of being able to do that is it allows people to go into environments that are really, really hazardous and dangerous, but still do the work that they need to do. So for example, these kinds of robots are used in things like nuclear plant cleanup, Chernobyl and, and Three Mile Island, were the two real areas where they came out. Um, I kind of cut my teeth on it in the mining industry. And so I um, started many years ago at INCO, and uh, before it became VAL. And one of the objectives of what we were doing was to try to create the automated uh, factory of the future. Along the way, kind of got hooked on telerobotics and automation, and the idea of being able to put people virtually in the seat in other environments. And so following when I left INCO, we began to work on robots for the mining industry but also for the space industry and for subsea. And as you see in the slide, it's an interesting mix because it allows people to have the adventure of being able to do the work as if they were there without having all the hazards that come with being there. So for example, James Cameron went to the bottom of the ocean a few weeks ago. Um, nobody realizes how dangerous it is to actually do that. Um, I, you can't send people there for great deals of time to actually do the study that's going to be required down there to learn some of the things that need to be learned. So we need to have these kind of robotic systems to allow that to occur. So teleautonomy enables both things to happen. You can sit inside of the machine, but you don't actually have to be there and take the risk. Um, I put up this slide many times because this was given to me by a friend in the United States. And um, many, many people like to think of, of building autonomous robots. And uh, the interesting part about autonomous robots is that I haven't met a robot yet that can repair itself. So if you buy a floor cleaning robot, if it could reach out with two little arms and tighten those screws and make sure the water went in it and all the soap got put in it, well, then you'd have an autonomous robot. But um, they're very, very difficult to find today. Probably the only ones are very simple, like the Survivor spacecraft that's traveling out in the world. Anyways, this slide was given to me, and uh, the lady was a, a good friend at MIT, and she said, we always use this slide to explain why teleautonomy is so important. Um, and she said, because so many times we've had to break the glass and bring the people back out to be able to do what needs to be done. Um, so one of the more important questions that I look into is, do we actually want autonomous robots completely? Um, 
How many people in here remember the movie Terminator? Terminator came out of a friend of mine by the name of Ray Kurzweil who uh, decided that there was going to be this thing called the singularity. And the singularity was a time when human intelligence and computer intelligence were going to become equal. Well, the movie Terminator is the epitome of that day. It's that robots can rule the world and people can't keep up. And so I tended in my career to stay away from the world of autonomy as much as I can because I like leaving people in the machines. Um, people have more fun in them. And uh, as you were saying, you want one? I can make it red if you really want it. <laughs> so um, I just want to give a little brief understanding for everybody about what the importance of the various pieces are. Um, I am a mining engineer who graduated in underground telecommunications and networking. Um, there's not many mining engineers that know anything about computer communications and networking. But um, that's what I have my doctorate in. And that is the absolute foundation of making some of this happen. So when I travel around the world, I just got home from Chile, um, you look at our environment around us and our cell phones and all the things we have available to us, that isn't available everywhere in the world, and we don't realize how advanced we actually are in terms of that kind of communication system. But without that, you don't have the foundation for the house that you need to build. The next one is positioning and navigation systems. And while this robot, Steph just moved it out, moved it back, um, what's really in the heart of this robot is probably the most advanced uh, positioning and navigation system that's ever been built for underground mining and underground uh, mapping. If you want to think of it, it is, it is what the Google car is that's around mapping California right now, but for underground excavation. And so this thing can go in and map everything below surface within a few centimeters, which is an unheard of uh, accuracy for that kind of work. The reason it can is it doesn't use GPS systems, which you would typically think are available, but they aren't. They don't go through the earth. And um, in doing that, you wouldn't realize some of the very large problems that are out there that people need this information for. For example, some very simple things like, uh, where are sewer tunnels? Everybody kind of takes them for granted. Um, Modern society would collapse if we didn't have a proper sewage system. And um, funny enough, most people know where the manholes are, where they come up on the roads, but nobody knows what's in the middle. And there's a nest of, of stuff down there that needs to be mapped and needs to be understood as the infrastructures of the world today are crumbling around us below ground. We just don't see them. And so this kind of robot is uh, quite important to be able to do that. Another area is in mapping of underground mines. Um, everybody's seen all the different mining disasters from the coal mines that have collapsed to the Chilean miner work that's going on. We, we were actually called in to bring these robots down as an after the fact of the, what happened with the Chilean miners. Because the mine collapsed in a in a way where there just wasn't enough rock. But nobody had a way to actually store all that information and analyze it because they, in the first place they just couldn't get it. It would cost too much money. And so these become quite uh, useful tools. Then you have to have the software for monitoring and control. And when you look at what Steph's sitting in the control chair, there's tiny little bits of control at the top and joysticks and a mouse, a mouse ball or a, a, pointing, a pointing mouse. We've tried to do everything to keep that as simple as possible. You know, it's not even as complicated as something that you'd see at McDonald's for pressing in the types of hamburgers and all the things. Because we try and make it simple that anybody can use the robots to do whatever they need to do. Um, as these pieces of equipment begin to collect information, um, to give you an idea, the positioning unit inside provides a data point every few milliseconds. The laser scanner on the top there provides 50,000 points an hour. 
over a distance of three quarters of a kilometer. The two scanners on the, on the, that are mounted, the blue one and the brown one, collect 230 points a second. So we can go in and create a virtual rendering of what an underground facility looks like that um, James Cameron would be proud of. Um, and then we have to get to the techniques of how to use this kind of technology. And uh, we just spent, uh, Kosi and, uh, and I, and a couple of others from our team, five weeks in Chile in the uh, largest underground copper mine in the world explaining how to map and how to use this technology to improve how they'll mine. Um, it was quite an interesting time. Steph was our uh, uh, guy on the phone, like in Charlie's Angels. Many of the young people won't remember that, but he was in the background on call pretty well all the time to talk to us. And then, uh, obviously, it's all about creating some dollars. Um, this is... If you look at it at first, when I started working on it 20 years ago, it was an invention. It's no longer an invention, it's an innovation. It's starting to generate money for our own economy and our business, where we already have orders for more of these robots from several different sources around, and we're looking at how we're going to manufacture them here in Sudbury. Um, interesting, because most people that I've met in the high school system, not just in Sudbury, but around... Uh, Northern Ontario think they have to go to Toronto or to New York or somewhere in the States to get a job working in this field. And uh, we're at a point now where our business is growing rapidly enough that we're going to have to start hiring a lot of people with these skills to be able to work on this stuff. So I want to talk for just a minute. This is a picture that we did for uh, some of the people down in, uh, in Chile. And uh, Armando Oliveri would be the equivalent of uh, uh, John Polisal here in Sudbury. And uh, the other people that we were working with were all kind of heads of their own department in engineering and all the various functions that they had. The two robots that you see there, the, the green one here is a duplicate of the one with the arm up. And the other one is a communications robot that lays out a, a self-constructed communications path. So we could go in in a mine rescue situation and, and have the uh, second robot build the computer network all the way into the mine without anybody having to go. Um, but what's the outcome of that kind of a scanning system? That profile there is a profile of the tunnel, one section of the tunnel that we collected underground at the mine. What's uh, kind of keen about it, or, or cool about it, is not so much what you see there, but a, a trained eye can see the things that are wrong with that picture as a result of not having this technology. And so I'll show you a couple of things in it. If you notice in the middle of it, there's kind of a wind in the, in the picture. That wind in the picture is called goosenecking. And when you work in a mining operation, if you get goosenecking, it causes all your drill holes to move out and you can't blast the ore properly. That's a big problem that they have to overcome and they couldn't overcome it because the miners didn't have the measurement tools to accomplish the task. Um, eventually, the stuff that's on these robots will go on to the actual mining machines that make our tunnels and our sewer systems to be able to make them much more accurately. The other issue is that if you notice there's a series of rings and they seem to kind of go in and out all the way through. Those need to go in and out all the way through consistently all the time. Um, they don't. And that shows that there's a lack of quality in the work that's been done. Not that they could have improved it, but that that's just what it generated. So um, I've, I wanted to talk a little bit about this and then we have another innovation outside, but I'm going to show you a video of it because the video of it is probably more explanatory than, than you'd have to get one of us to show you outside. But um, one of the big problems with this are these uh, little white antennas right here. That little white antenna is a Wi-Fi network designed to work in a Starbucks. Works great if you have your iPhone or your whatever it is. But it hasn't been designed for industrial applications. And, uh, Many people are relying on that kind of technology for creating these kind of future robots. 
Problem is, that antenna will only allow you to, to run two robots. Whether they're two big mining pieces of equipment, or two big tunnel borers, or two big whatever, and most of these operations require 60 to 100 to 200 pieces of equipment. And so the little antenna needs to be two or three hundred times the capacity that it is today. So we began to work on a new form of communications. And uh, the new form of communications was to take all the bad parts of Wi-Fi and to be able to use light in its place. These two units that you see up on the uh, screen are blue light units and they're turning those little LEDs on and off about uh, 40 million times a second. Which means you can digitize a video picture. It's exactly how animation works and exactly how the whole news business and the theater business work is digitizing images. Well, what we were able to do was to digitize them with those two units. To tell you a really interesting story about them is that as a breakthrough, it's such a big breakthrough that we had one of the major uh, companies in the United States try and steal it from us. And we went through, uh, fortunately, we have some good guys working on our team who are legal guys who made them sign some documents on the way in. And uh, I was all ready to sell it to them. And they were like, no, 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 you can't do that. And so we... Uh, got them to sign all these documents that they wouldn't tamper with it, that they wouldn't do this, and they wouldn't do that. And low enough, uh, we came back after we went down to visit them, and one of the units was completely ripped apart. And um, I, can, I now understand why, but I didn't at the time. But uh, since that time, the good part about that is, having been in, in doing this kind of work in INCO, um, I was used to that kind of industrial espionage and the kind of things that may potentially go on. And so uh, we didn't tell them to send them the stuff that was really of value. We sent them the red herrings. And so they now have all that trying to keep up with us. But uh, the work that you see here in the pool um, is quite unique in that you can see in the webcam things are move, moving slowly. Um, by my hand waving. But on the other, and you'll see in a second Alberto, who's in the audience over there, at the other side, beginning to uh, wave back. But we're putting these communication systems inside of water and transmitting that kind of commuter, computer communications through water, which is thought to be impossible up to this point. Um, the United States Navy has tried for years to sort that out. And uh, what we were able to achieve from one side of the pool to the other was about 75 megabits per second and watch that DVD, not just one, but two of them simultaneously coming from one side to the other. Um, that was a pretty interesting night because later on in the night, you'll see that we uh, went underwater in Long Lake and did the same test. Um, that opens up the door for untethered robots underwater in oceans. It opens the door for some really sophisticated changes to these robots that are, are open to uh, a lot of the new technologies that are going to come at us. Um, there's been a TED talk done by some people in Europe around LED technology without understanding that we were that far ahead in the research work we were doing here in Sudbury. And so uh, with that, I'll leave you with the DVDs playing from one side of the boat to the other. Thank you. <laughs>